Today on the Matt Wall Show, as red states move to ban the procedure, states like Minnesota are passing legislation to declare themselves sanctuaries for child mutilation. One father of a quote-unquote trans six-year-old testified in favor of the bill. His testimony is being hailed as heroic and beautiful by the left, but I have a different take, as you might expect. Also, the College Board makes changes to its AP African American Studies course after pushback from conservatives. A BBC correspondent celebrates the, quote, beautiful piece of hand luggage, i.e. a baby that he had via the womb that he rented. Vegan activists hatch a disastrous plan to shut down a slaughterhouse. In our daily cancellation, we explore the depressing world of divorce coaches. All of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. You know, if you own a business, the past few years have been a bumpy ride. From COVID lockdowns to Biden inflation, you could probably use a break, and innovation refunds can help with that. If your business has five or more employees and managed to survive COVID, you could be eligible to receive a payroll tax rebate of up to $26,000 per employee. It's not a loan. There's no payback. It is a refund of your taxes. Um, the uh, challenge, though, is simply just to get your hands on it. How do, you, how do you cut through all the red tape and get your business the refund money that you're owed and that you deserve. Well, you gotta go to getrefunds.com. Their team of tax attorneys are highly trained in this little known payroll tax refund program and have already returned $1 billion to businesses and they can help you do the same. They do all the work, no charge up front. They simply share a percentage of the cash that they get back for you. Businesses of all types can qualify, including those who took PPP, nonprofits, and even those that had increases in sales, all could be eligible for this. So if you want to uh, find out more, go to getrefunds.com, click on qualify me and answer a few questions. This payroll tax refund is only available for a limited amount of time, so don't miss out. Go to GetRefunds.com. That's GetRefunds.com. Well, as we've been tracking on the show for years, the Republican Party did virtually nothing to fight back against gender ideology and the trans agenda's indoctrination and abuse of children. Uh, they have been doing virtually nothing to fight back against it, but finally that has changed, and not by accident. Those in the anti gender ideology movement, otherwise known as you know the sanity movement or the reality movement, whatever term you want to use, have been in the trenches fighting against this madness for a long time. And it's through those efforts that we now find ourselves in a position where states across the country are passing laws banning the mutilation, castration, and abuse of gender-confused children. Utah, as we mentioned yesterday, is the, is the latest state to pass a measure banning medical transitions on children. And that is significant because it was, uh, it was less than a year ago that Utah's Republican governor, Spencer Cox, vetoed a bill that would have banned males from female sports. And his stated reason was that he wasn't, uh, he said he wasn't an, quote, expert on transgenderism, and therefore, because he's not an expert on it, all he could do was, quote, err on the side of kindness, mercy, and compassion. It was one of the most shameful episodes of squishiness we've ever seen from the squish party, and that's saying a lot. Banning males from female sports is, uh, it's a layup, no pun intended. You don't need to be an expert on anything. You just need to have common sense, and that's how you know that it's the right move. And you don't, need, you don't even need political courage to do it because most Americans agree that sports should be segregated based on sex. Yet Cox went limp and surrendered anyway. Now, that was back in March of 2022, so not all that long ago. Fast forward to January 2023, and here he is signing a bill banning child gender transitions. He was afraid of being called a transphobe just a few months ago. Now uh, he's signing legislation that, has, that, that will have him labeled a transphobe by every corporate media publication in the country. All the people that he was mad, uh, that he was uh, worried about being mad at him are going to be even more mad at him now because of this. So what changed? Did he somehow discover a backbone? Did he undergo his own gender transition from spineless jellyfish to actual human man? Probably not. Instead, the, the political realities changed because we forced them to change. You and me, those of us who have been speaking out and fighting back against this trans madness, we changed the political atmosphere by basically force of will. Change it so that even a guy like Spencer Cox has no choice but to do the right thing. And several other states, of course, are in line to do the same. Now, on the federal level, the only 2024 candidate officially in the race at this point, Donald Trump, announced this week uh, a series of proposals to eradicate the trans agenda from schools and doctor's offices and government agencies nationwide. And we mentioned this briefly on the show yesterday, but it's, it's worth listening to, to some of his proposal as he outlined it. And uh, here it is, listen. The left-wing gender insanity being pushed on our children is an act of child abuse. Very simple. Here's my plan to stop the chemical, physical, and emotional mutilation of our youth. 
On day one, I will revoke Joe Biden's cruel policies on so-called gender-affirming care. Ridiculous. A process that includes giving kids puberty blockers, mutating their physical appearance, and ultimately performing surgery on minor children. Can you believe this? I will sign a new executive order instructing every federal agency to cease all programs that promote the concept of sex and gender transition at any age. I will then ask Congress to permanently stop federal taxpayer dollars from being used to promote or pay for these procedures and pass a law prohibiting child sexual mutilation in all 50 states. It'll go very quickly. I will declare that any hospital or healthcare provider that participates in the chemical or physical mutilation of minor youth will no longer meet federal health and safety standards for Medicaid and Medicare and will be terminated from the program immediately. Furthermore, I will support the creation of a private right of action for victims to sue doctors who have unforgivably performed these procedures on minor children. Well, it's all very similar to the law that we're getting passed here in Tennessee. Um, but Tennessee is just one state. We need exactly this. We need exactly this on the national level as well. Trump also says, uh, as he goes on to say, that, the, that he would direct the Department of Justice to investigate hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, uh, doctors, to find out if they've been involved in a cover-up of the horrific long-term side effects uh, and, uh, of gender transition drugs and surgeries. Now, the answer, of course, is that, yes, they have been covering those things up as any genuine and thorough investigation will clearly show, which is why the next step under a Trump administration or any Republican administration should be to arrest the culprits, the um, hundreds and hundreds of them, if not thousands of them, and throw them in federal prison. Now, this can't be a matter of simple fines and financial penalties. I mean, that should be part of it. But uh, the only real recourse here, the only semblance of justice would be prison sentences, very long ones. Now, if it were up to me, we, you know, we'd go... Further than that, as far as I'm concerned, mutilating and castrating children should be legally considered a capital crime, and it should earn the prescribed penalty for such crimes. But if we can't have that, then prison will have to suffice. These are all very positive developments. Yet we know that the left isn't going to take any of this lying down. They were so close in their minds to achieving their genderless dystopia uh, that they're not going to give up now. They can't because gender ideology is the, the centerpiece of their entire cultural agenda. They can't give up on it. They can't give it up without giving the whole game away, which they're not going to do. And so while red states move to protect children from these forms of physical and sexual abuse, blue states are doubling down on the abuse and doing everything in their power to ensure that more and more kids are fed into the you know, transgender wood chipper. Most recently, the state of Minnesota, which is uh, following in the steps of states like California, has introduced legislation to officially declare itself a sanctuary state for trans kids. In other words, Democrats in Minnesota want to traffic children into the state so that they can be castrated and sterilized. These people, are, they're not satisfied with simply butchering the children who already live in Minnesota. They want the state to become a destination, a, a hub for such abuse. Representative Lee Finke is a, a man who says he's a woman and he wrote this legislation and then explained it on the House floor this week in Minnesota. Listen to this. There are gender diverse people in Minnesota right now receiving gender affirming care. More are fleeing their home states asking where they should turn. There are people in the audience today who have come here for this very reason. There are doctors in Minnesota right now providing this world class gender affirming care. And there are parents who are terrified about what unknown consequences may come from simply affirming their child's authentic self. This is new law. It's complex and there are questions that still need to be answered. But we can answer those questions and we need to do so right now. Utah banned gender affirming care last Saturday. They were not the first state to do so and they will not be the last. Tennessee is close behind them. South Dakota is moving. The organized political movement that has targeted my community is at work in every state that touches ours. Well, you're damn right. We are, we are, we are targeting your community. We are. And by your community, the community we're targeting, 
Um, I'm referring to the community of child abusers. Of course, Finke is supposed to be seen as an authority here because he identifies as trans himself. But of course, that only makes him less reliable. He, he has a vested personal interest in transing the kids because it makes him feel better about his own lifestyle choices, which is, which is the motivation for guys like him. For Finke, affirming the children, quote unquote, is really about affirming himself. And you'll notice this about the vast majority of the voices speaking up in favor of transing the kids. Most of them are either alleged medical professionals who stand to financially profit from this, or they are trans activists desperately seeking affirmation and validation for their own self-identities. And on the other side, who are the people on the other side that are, that are speaking out against this? Well, you have people who don't benefit in any selfish way at all from the position that we've taken on this subject. We don't make money on kids who are not trans. Like, we don't make money on kids who are protected from the trans agenda. Every child who's protected from the trans agenda does not translate into money for us, whereas on the other side, every child who is fed into the trans agenda and uh, claimed by it translates into money for them. And we're also not seeking any sort of emotional validation or affirmation of our own lifestyles. We know who we are. We're, 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 we're not worried about that. We simply just believe in defending the truth for the truth's own sake, and we believe in protecting kids for their own sake. That's it. But back to the other side, the debate over the sanctuary state bill in uh, Minnesota also featured the testimony of a father who claims that his own six-year-old child is, quote, trans. And this video is being passed around on social media by trans activists who say that they were brought to tears uh, by it. But, you know, it's so emotional and beautiful, they said, um, you can listen yourself and tell me how beautiful you think this actually is. Listen. My wife and I are here today um, because we have a trans, trans child. Ash was six years old. At three, she was not sleeping very well. She was waking up every single night. It was a lot more than just a toddler waking up. And one day I picked her up from daycare and um, all the teachers had said, Asher told us that she's a she. And I said to these wonderful daycare people who had never had a trans kid before at a pretty religious place, so what'd you do? And they said, we called her a her. And I said, great. Oh my God, great. And Asher comes around the corner and I said, hey, there's my beautiful daughter. And I've, I, I, I think there are a few things in this world that are, I'll remember for my whole life, and, and that is one of them. The smile on her face, the look of affirmation, the confidence she had to tell her teachers who had known her since diapers that she was a she, that her father said, there's my beautiful daughter. Well, speaking of people who should be in prison, um, there's one there. You know, I've, I've heard many, many testimonies from parents of young, quote, trans kids and I've yet to hear of a single quote unquote trans kid who was acting differently in any significant way from any other kid their age. So their father tells us that his son was waking up in the middle of the night when he was three. Wow, that's, that's something. Wow, a, a, a toddler isn't sleeping well? Who's ever heard of such a thing? This requires, uh, I mean, this requires us to, to radically rethink the kid's uh, very identity because they're not sleeping well. I mean, well, you know, I, I have four kids three and th that are three years or, old, or older, and um, we've actually gone through the not sleeping well three-year-old phase with, oh, I, I don't know, every single one of them. My six-year-old son, when he was three, he, he woke up between midnight and 2 a.m. and started playing with his toys or like walking around the house and he would do this every night for at least six months, every single night. And I had a lot of thoughts and feelings about the fact that he kept waking up and waking the whole house up. Um, I felt many things, most of, most of them frustration. But it never occurred to me that he was waking up because he was tortured by the thought that he might have been born in the wrong body. That's just that's something that never crossed my mind. And there are many insane things that never occurred to me, in fact. And, uh, well, that's, I guess that's really just only one of them. But it's not simply, let's not sell this father short. It's not simply that young Asher, I think his name was, was waking up a lot in the middle of the night, as toddlers tend to do. He also, at the age of three, announced himself 
as a girl at daycare. Um, and that's all it took. A few sleepless nights, a random declaration from a toddler, and uh, that's all this guy needed. His poor son has now been doomed to a life of confusion, identity crisis, despair, eventual medical and surgical mutilation. Why is that? Well, because the father obviously wanted a trans child. He wanted the fashion accessory to carry around. He wanted his, his child to become a vehicle for his own virtue signaling. And he took the first opportunity that came his way. That's the kind of thing we're fighting against. While the other side doubles down and gets more extreme in their evil, we have to double down and become more extreme in our defense of truth and of kids. That's the path forward. And I'm happy to see that it's the path we're finally walking down. Now let's get to our headlines. If the past couple of years have taught us anything, it's that in a crisis, like a global pandem pandemic or a natural disaster, even the basics can be hard to come by. You need to be prepared for anything. And that's why my new partners at Jace Medical are here and they can help. Jace Medical helps you get a long-term supply of prescription medication. Their mission is to empower you to be better medically prepared in the case, uh, case of any kind of emergency. A great way to start preparing is with the Jace case, a pack of five different courses of antibi antibiotics that you can use to treat a whole host of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinuses, um, skin infections, and much more. All you have to do is fill out a simple online form and in some cases, jump on a quick call with one of their board certified physicians. From there, you can ask your physician treatment uh, related questions on an ongoing basis. And, um, and you can do all of this to make sure that you are prepared in case of, uh, of anything. And as we said, we know that the last couple of years in particular have shown us um, how important preparedness is, especially if you have, uh, have kids. The Jace case gives me peace of mind, I can tell you, knowing that my family will have what we need if the worst happens. And I want you to be prepared for anything as well. All you got to do is go to jacemedical.com, enter code Walsh at checkout for a discount on your order. That's jacemedical.com, promo code Walsh. All right, so we'll begin with some news from uh, APnews.com. It says, high school senior uh, Kalila Bendili is used, to, is used to courses that don't address the African-American experience. Then there's her 9 a.m. class. This week, it spanned topics from Afro-Caribbean migration to jazz. The discussion in her advanced placement course on African-American studies touched on figures from Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, to Jimi Hendrix, and Rihanna. Uh, in her AP European history course, she said, we're not discussing black people at all, even though they were colonized by Europeans. Her, well, that's, I, I mean, that, that's shocking to me. Why aren't they discussing Rihanna in their European history course? That, I mean, this, this is, a, that's racism. I can't think of any other reason why you wouldn't be talking about Rihanna in your European history course. What about in your astronomy class? Does Beyonce ever come up? If not, there's racism. It says her school in Baton Rouge, Louisiana is one of 60 schools around the country testing the new course, which has gained national attention since Florida Governor Ron DeSantis threatened to ban it in his state. The rejection has stirred new political debate over how schools teach about race. The official curriculum for the course, released Wednesday by the College Board, downplays some components that had drawn criticism from DeSantis and other conservatives. Topics including Black Lives Matter, slavery reparations, and queer life are not part of the exam. Instead, they are included only on a sample list uh, that states and school systems can choose from for student projects. The College Board, which oversees AP exams, said revisions to the course were substantially complete before DeSantis shared his objections. So that's kind of the headline here, that um, there was this uh, new African-American AP history course that was devised by the College Board, being rolled out in public schools across the country, and it included a lot of radical far-left propaganda uh, Ron DeSantis, among others, brought that up and was objecting to it and said that it wasn't going to be allowed in his state. And now um, the College Board has re revised it and they've supposedly downplayed a lot of those uh, political elements. And But they claim that, oh, we were going to do that anyway. We were totally going to do that anyway. It's not because, it's not because you conservatives, uh, it's not because we're not caving to backlash from you. But of course they really are, um, which is good. You know, I, 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 this is something we've seen, in fact, more and more recently, that uh, backlash from the right actually gets results. And that's, uh, that is a, a, a new phenomenon in a lot of ways. Now, that doesn't mean 
that problem solved here or that we should at all trust this African-American studies course, uh, of course, of course we shouldn't because it was always meant to be a vehicle for far left propaganda. That's what it was always intended to be. And if the course still exists at all, then it is still going to be a vehicle for far left propaganda, even if they supposedly are um, downplaying the certain elements of it that have drawn objection you know, from the right. It's still there, it's still a propaganda course. I mean, why would uh, something like queer life, as the AP puts it, or BLM, which is a political scam organization, why would that ever be a part of an African-American studies program to begin with? Well, because these programs are fundamentally ideological. Um, and the, the queer stuff in particular gets shoehorned in because it is central to their agenda. I mean, everything always comes down to that on the left. Every subject ultimately comes down to uh, an exploration of gender and sexuality because that is their, on the left, that is their, their single preoccupation. It's what they care the most about. And so everything will come down to that. But if, you, if we want to get some, you know, I think some really insightful analysis of uh, this debate about African-American studies and what belongs in school and what doesn't, well, uh, I think we should turn to the one place where we turn for insightful analysis of really any subject, and that is, of course, The View, um, where Whoopi Goldberg had some thoughts about all this, and in particular about uh, Ron DeSantis. And let's give that a listen. I don't understand why he believes that he wants people to see the, the history of Western civilization and history and philosophy of Western civilization, because he, he wants it seen through that lens. Why is your lens better than my lens? <laughs> what, what? You know, so you're basically saying... Like to people like Marion Croak, you're not going to teach about her. Her history is American history. What, what, what is it that he doesn't get? We're not going anywhere. Just because you stop teaching it in the colleges, you think people are going to stop telling these stories? You're, a, you're, no, it's not going to happen. Amen. Amen to that utter nonsense. Um, of course, there's, there are a couple problems here. And uh, all, all stemming from the fact that Whoopi Goldberg has, you know, an IQ of uh, 14. So, and she's also a dishonest hack as well, obviously. Otherwise, she wouldn't be, she wouldn't be on that show. But a couple of problems. First, she says, she says uh, well, African-American history is American history. Yeah, well, right. That's the point. That, that's actually the point that's being made by people like Ron DeSantis and anyone else who objects to these kinds of courses in public school. We actually, we don't need to break American history down on, on racial lines. We don't need to say, well, let's do the history of this race, and then the history of this race, and the history of that race. Um, let's teach American history, which will encompass people of different races. Nobody ever claimed otherwise. That's our point, to be clear. But then she also seems to suggest that what DeSantis is really doing, and she's not the only one, this is what we're hearing from the left, that um, because DeSantis and other conservatives are objecting to this radical far left uh, African-American studies course, what we're really saying is that we don't want um, black people mentioned in the school at all. We, we, we don't want any of them mentioned. So this is, you know what this is? This is don't say gay 2.0. This, this is the don't say gay hysteria uh, you know, completely fraudulent, phony hysteria ginned up by the media. And this is that all over again. It's Don't Say Gay 2.0. Where they took a, with Don't Say Gay bill, which is a bill that never existed, they took a bill that really just protects very young children in the school system from being sexually indoctrinated by their teachers. And then they, they claim that it meant that the word gay is never allowed to be said anywhere around the school system. And now what they're claiming is that, uh, I, now it's the, what is it? This, this is the don't say black bill, I guess is what they're saying. That we're not allowed to acknowledge black people at all and they're being erased from American history, uh, which, is, which is not the case. In fact, it's what we're saying is the opposite. Let's teach American history, the history of this country, and, um, and that includes the significant contributions of everyone, no matter what the race was. Um, now, 
It is true, and this, of course, is the, the problem that the left has, that, uh, well, if you teach American history and you're talking about the significant contributions made by anyone, regardless of their race, that means that you will be acknowledging the contributions of lots of white men, too. Uh, that's there'll be lots of white men going back to the founding of the country and, uh, and ever since then. And that's, that is actually their problem. They don't want to have to acknowledge that. Uh, Joy Reid also, we've already heard from Whoopi Goldberg, so let's throw Joy Reid in as well. She also lashed out at Ron DeSantis, but uh, only made him sound even better in the process, which is usually the way these things work. Here she is. What DeSantis is doing is intentional. In order to peel off Trump's Republican voters and get them on his side ahead of his presidential bid in 2024, he's turning Florida into a right-wing paradise where the focus isn't on health care or jobs or taxes or infrastructure or I don't know, hurricane or flood insurance in one of the most natural disaster-prone states in the country. You know, normal governor stuff. But rather on the right-wing culture wars and nothing but the right-wing culture wars. And he's ticking all the boxes. Not only is he banning books about history and any mention of the existence of gay people from Florida schools, he's barring public high schools from teaching AP African American studies. He's taking aim at drag performances, even suggesting that he would urge the state's child protective services to investigate parents who take their own kids to one. He's actively trying to ban COVID vaccine mandates and restricting mask rules, while at the same time calling for probes into supposed wrongdoing linked to the vaccine. And he's doing all of this while making sure that anyone can walk around with a gun, no permit required. It's a right-wing fantasy land like Disney World, but in hell. Come to Florida, the meanest place on earth. Sounds great to me. Uh, of course, m- much of what she said there is, we, we heard again there that she's he's banning any mention of the existence of gay people. That's total fabrication. This is just what they, they, they make this up. And of course, there's never going to be any fact check or anything like that from our uh, brave fact checking organizations out there. But I think this is a really good, this is... Um, you know, this, this shouldn't necessarily be your primary motivation as a leader, as a governor, but um, it is a pretty good sign that you're on the right path when someone like Joy Reid says that this is that you've you know you're you've turned your state into a nightmare and she'd never want to move there. This is uh, you, you could do worse if you're trying to figure out what sort of state, what sort of community to build. Well, build the kind of community. That joy that a person like Joy Reid would never want to move into, um, and if that if 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 that's your path forward, if that's kind of your your guiding light, well, you could do a lot worse. That's for sure. Here's an article from the uh, Virginia Pilot. It says a House of Delegates subcommittee on Monday passed a bill that would ban transgender girls and women from competing on female sports teams at the K through 12 schools and universities. Delegate Karen Greenhall, who introduced the measure, told at legislators they had a responsibility to stand up for female athletes. Similarly gifted and trained males will always have the physical advantage over females, which is the reason we have women's sports, said Greenhall. These, uh, those opposed to the bill argued that it discriminated against transgender youth. So we're talking about these kinds of bills across the country. It's also happening in, uh, in Virginia. But I bring this up in particular because of testimony that was offered by um, Riley Gaines. She's a recent graduate from the University of Kentucky, where she had been a member of the women's swim swim team. And um, she said it was unfair that she had to compete against Leah Thomas, who's the male who identified it as a woman. And we'll listen to a little bit of her experience. Here it is. In addition to being forced to give up our awards, our titles, and our opportunities, the NCAA forced female swimmers to share a locker room with Thomas a 6'4", 22-year-old male who was fully intact with male genitalia. Let me be clear. We were not forewarned. We were not asked for our consent. We did not give our consent. If nothing else, I hope you can truly see how this is a violation of our privacy and how some of us have felt uncomfortable, awkward, um, embarrassed, and even traumatized by this experience. I know I don't speak for everyone. 
I, it's impossible to speak for everyone, but I can attest to the tears that were shed on that pool deck by these poor ninth and 17th place finishers who missed out on being named an All-American by one place. And I can attest to the extreme discomfort in the locker room when you turn around and there's a male watching you undress while exposing himself. I can attest to the anger and frustration from these girls who had worked so hard and sacrificed so much to get to this point. Yeah, she says she doesn't speak uh, for for everyone, and uh, well, she's right. She's, it's, it's, it's as she said, it's impossible to speak for everyone. Uh, there, there might be, maybe like I'd, I'd have to, I'd, I, I would I would have to leave open the theoretical possibility that there might be some women out there who actually do want a man such as Leah Thomas disrobing in the locker room with them. Maybe there are some women out there who, who really are gung-ho about it and say, yeah, I want more. I want, I want more uh, men parading around the locker room with their penises hanging out. That's, I, I want more of that. Maybe there are some women out there who really feel that way. I suspect that if those women exist at all, uh, they are very, very few and far between. What you have instead are a bunch of women, you have, you have some women who have spoken out bravely about this and are willing to speak out, um, many more who have uh, complained about it privately but haven't spoken out in public, and then, and then many more who have said nothing at all but are extremely uncomfortable with it. And the reason they haven't said anything is because they're worried about the penalties that they'll suffer, um, both academic penalties, you know, the social consequences and all the rest of it being shamed as a transphobe and everything. Um, and then there are many more women who have actually come out in favor of it verbally because they think that that's what they're supposed to do and they want to show off their virtue and they want to win those social credit points. But of course, in reality, they'd prefer to have the locker room to themselves. So I think when it comes to the locker room issue in particular, those groups that I've just outlined, that probably encompasses almost all women. Um, the number of women who are genuinely excited about the prospect, the reality of males disrobing in the locker room, it, it's got to be, it's virtually non-existent. And this has always been, you know, we hear about when it comes to Leah Thomas or any of these males competing against women, um, mu much of the conversation focuses around what's happening in the pool or on the track or, you know, what's happening in the competition and the way that th these, these opportunities and medals and trophies are being taken away from women. And that is a problem. It is, uh, it's a travesty in many ways. But what's happening in the locker room is even, I mean, far worse. This is far more insidious. That these women are being forced to in, endure this and being screamed at and told to just shut up and deal with it while a man disrobes in front of them. It is truly, truly evil and, uh, and sick. Speaking of evil and sick, here's a tweet that's gone viral over the last, past few days. Um, it's from a correspondent for the BBC named Mark Lowen. And he tweeted this along with a picture. He says, after six weeks in wonderful and tearful uh, farewells to our incredible, or, or sorry, after six weeks in wonderful Canada, it doesn't say Canada, there's a Canadian flag. I'm still learning how to read uh, these hieroglyphic posts where they use pictures instead of words. After six weeks in wonderful Canada and tearful farewells to our incredible surrogate and friend, it's time to go home to Lisbon with our new family member, our most beautiful hand luggage. Canada, you are a shining light of democracy and equality. Thank you for letting us fulfill our dream. And then you see the two men there holding a baby that was, uh, that was conceived and birthed via surrogacy. You know, we've, we've had this conversation about surrogacy before on the show. And um, as I have been arguing all along, this is a, a deeply evil practice. This is the commodification of a children. It's the commodification of a woman's body. I mean, the idea that you can rent out a woman's body for the purposes of, you know, growing a child that will then, and that child will then be separated permanently from, from his mother, and that you're doing all of this to 
Not because it's best for the child. This is not being done because it's best for the child. There, there, there's, there's no world where it's the best thing for the child to be conceived and born via surrogacy and then separated from his mother forever. That's never in the best interest of the child. But you're doing it for you to satisfy your own desires. In fact, you hear Mark Lowen say it here. Thank you for letting us fulfill our dream. But it's also in this particular case, um, this post really jumps out at you because it's so on the nose when he refers to the child as hand luggage. Our most beautiful hand luggage. This is something that, you know, a real parent, it, it, you, you love your child, you would, you would never refer to your kid that way. Uh, you know, people might have different funny sort of ways of, of talking about parenthood and everything. Nobody would, no, no actual parent would refer to their, their child who's just been born as beautiful hand luggage. But that's the way they see it. That's, that's what the child is. The child is, uh, is an accessory for these men. It is totally dehumanizing to both the child and the woman. Um, you know, the, the commercialized renting and purchasing of a womb for the purposes of fulfilling these, the, the, the quote, dreams of these gay men is uh, incredibly sinister and wrong. But this is also what you end up with in a culture where we've decided that the, the ultimate good is the fulfillment of, your, of the individual's own desires, like satisfying the individual's own desires, the individual's own ego. Uh, we've decided that's, that's what we've structured our entire culture around, that um, we each uh, have our, our own universe that we live in, and that universe revolves around us. And the most important thing in that universe is how we feel and affirming our own feelings. And in that kind of situation, it's no surprise that uh, we do things like rent out a woman's womb so that gay men can grow children and then uh, separate them forever from their biological mother in order to satisfy their own desires. All right, finally, this video went viral. Um, I don't know where or when it was taken, but it's apparently, from, from, from the way it's being described, it's apparently vegan activists somewhere who uh, are protesting a slaughterhouse, and their way of protesting the slaughterhouse is to try to stop a truck from going into the slaughterhouse. They're, they're saying that the, the, the truck has uh, animals in it that are being brought into their demise, and so they want to stop this huge truck from going in, and they have their way of attempting to do that, which doesn't work out. Spoiler alert, doesn't work out too well for them, but uh, here's a video. Standing here in front of a Fearman slaughterhouse where 10,000 lives are taken daily, 10,000 innocent lives slaughtered here for no more than the taste buds of humankind, of humans. Here we have the truck approaching where approximately 300 animals are stacked into this truck. We're gonna, we're gonna stop this truck so we can bear witness. got run over. I'm lunatic. I'm going to stop. These drivers have no respect for life, no respect for human life, no respect for animal life. Psychopath. Jeez, what is wrong with that guy? Is, I, I, I'm shell shocked. How's I, I almost got hurt when I threw myself in front of a truck. How could that have happened? Wow, jeez. 
What exactly? They are not setting their best. The vegans aren't. I don't know if it's because they're not getting enough protein in their diet, so their brains are atrophying a little bit. Uh, that's that does happen. That's science. So I don't know if that's what's. Maybe that is. Maybe this is their best. That's the thing. I, I keep seeing vegan activists and the stunts that they pull, and uh, and and I always assume, well, this can't be their best. But I think the reality is that this is this is the best they got. So, what exactly was the plan? It's you. We we see at the beginning that there are people on the sides of this uh, huge big rig, and they're holding on to the sides of it as if they think that through that just by holding it, they can stop it from moving. And the truck keeps going, and then they try to throw themselves in front of the truck, and the truck continues on its way. And I don't think the truck actually did run anybody, anybody over, uh, thankfully for the vegans. But if you had, that would have been their fault. You throw yourself in front of a truck, that's on you. And by the way, you know, when you've got, even if they are uh, a bunch of noodly armed vegans, even so, when you have people, uh, mobs of people trying to stop your car in the middle of the road, um, you, the, the safest thing is to keep going because we've seen what happens in the past. When you stop for these people, you get pulled out of the truck, you never know what will happen. So for your own safety and also for the safety of that, of that precious cargo in the back, on its way to the slaughterhouse. And for all the, the rest, the, the sake of all the rest of us who want to enjoy that delicious bacon, you have no choice but to continue going, I think. All right, let's get to the comment section. Whether you've quit your New Year's resolution or you're still going strong, it's never too late to start paying off those credit cards. If uh, one of your goals is to take control of your credit card debt, which is a great goal to have, well, then you need to check out Lightstream. A credit card consolidation from Lightstream can help you pay off your credit cards and it can lock in a low fixed interest rate. Rates start at 7.99% APR with auto pay and excellent credit. Plus, the rate is fixed, so it will never increase over the life of the loan. You get a loan from $5,000 to $100,000 without any fees at all. You can even get your money as soon as the day you apply. Lightstream believes that people with good credit deserve a better loan experience, and that's exactly what they deliver to, uh, to everybody. And just for my listeners, you can apply now to get a special interest rate discount, and you can save even more at the same time. The only way to get this discount is to go to lightstream.com slash Walsh. That's L-I-G-H-T-R-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash Walsh. Subject to credit approval, rates range from 7.99% APR to 23.99% APR and include 0.5% auto pay discount. Lowest rate requires excellent credit. Terms and conditions apply. Offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash Walsh for more information. Jessica says, I think he should have made the gender cake. I understand and agree with him about not customizing a gay marriage cake, but the gender cake was not customized. Both the customer and the baker were acting out of hate. That's been brewing. How is it hate on the part of the baker? Yeah, you're right about the customer acting on the uh, out hate, trying to entrap Jack Phillips, um, trying to intentionally put him in a position so that he can be sued. So yes, he's acting out of hate there. But uh, the baker just doesn't want to be a part of any kind of celebration of a quote-unquote gender transition. Because that would be to participate in a lie, for one thing, and it's a celebration of self-harm and self-mutilation and a lot of terrible things. The baker says, I don't, want to be a, I don't want to be a part of that. You can't force me to be a part of that. I don't want to be a part of that event. And just because I've opened a bakery, this small town bakery, doesn't mean that I'm required to be a part of any event that someone demands I, I participate in. So, no, he's just as justified in not wanting to make the quote-unquote gender transition cake as not wanting to customize the gay wedding cake. This is not only freedom of speech. This is a, this is a, a fundamental case of freedom of association. You should not be forced to associate yourself with an event that uh, you find morally abhorrent. For whatever your reasons are, it doesn't matter. And it, this doesn't need to be grounded, especially the gender transition thing, yeah, Jack Phillips is a Christian, but this is not. This really has nothing to do with religious liberty necessarily. Yeah, it would be it would be immoral according to the Christian faith to participate in an evil event like that. But you don't need to be a Christian to see uh, the, the the problem with you know the concept of gender transition and celebrating it with a cake. So this is basic free speech, freedom of association, and that's it. And. 
you know, at the same time, if this person really just wanted the cake for this celebration, uh, uh, he could have just said, I'd like a pink cake with blue icing. And he could have said that, and he would have got that because because Jack Phillips would not. If you ever, you know, any baker you've ever been to, they don't demand details on the kind of ceremony that you're celebrating. Now, if you offer it because you want the cake customized for like a birthday, then yeah. But uh, if you just go in there and say, "I want this cake," they're not going to make you fill out a questionnaire with a bunch of uh, information about the type of event. And that didn't happen here. That information was volunteered. And then Jack Phillips said, "Well, now that you've told me that, um, and you've given me that information unsolicited." Now I have to respond accordingly. Actual final boss says, I can't believe the media continues to misgender Matt as a blogger. He's clearly a, a vlogger. Thank you very much. That is what I identify as. Um, Kristen Funk says, we need Matt to do a segment on Velma. Nothing I want to see more than Matt put Mindy Kaling to task. Uh, I, I'm only even vaguely aware of the Velma. So, so I know that people are upset about Velma. Velma is, what is it, the Netflix, or maybe it's HBO Max, something like that. One of the streaming services did a spinoff of Scooby-Doo. It's a cartoon. And in the spinoff, number one, I mean, the first problem is that, from what I've been told, um, Scooby-Doo is is not even featured at all in the, the show. So they've taken Scooby-Doo out, and it all focuses around Velma, who's like a lesbian and genderqueer or whatever, and they put a bunch of woke uh, stuff into it and all the rest of it. Um, and they've also made this a cartoon that's targeted supposedly towards, you know, adults. Although I'm sure there are plenty of kids watching it. Um, that's all I know about it. I really have nothing interesting to say about it other than th th this is yet more evidence of the fact that all we get from Hollywood is a, is a bunch of garbage. Um, and like, even if it was, you know what, even if it was a faithful spinoff of Scooby-Doo, I would object to it even without all, I mean, with all the woke stuff that's disgusting and, and abhorrent and uh, it doesn't belong in a cartoon especially because even if they claim it's targeted towards older people, it's still, you're still going to end up with kids watching it. So that doesn't belong there. But um, even without that, like, do we need another, do you have all these franchises with a million spinoffs and everything? was there ever that much meat on the bone to begin with? You take something like Scooby-Doo. You know, it was, a, it was a vaguely amusing cartoon, came out decades ago. There was never that much meat on the bone. There's, there's, not, there's not enough content there to support a decades-long franchise with films and uh, spinoffs and different shows and everything. Just let it rest. Let it go. Uh. And Rodrigo says, I have to disagree about your anxiety rant. While I agree the teacher didn't manage the situation the best way, anxiety or more uh, specifically chronic anxiety is a mental disorder. While normal anxiety has a clear and reasonable reason for it, and if that reason disappears, the anxiety disappears. Chronic anxiety does not have any of that. While normal anxiety is like fear, an alarm that signals something stressful, chronic anxiety is like a phobia, a broken alarm that needs to be fixed. But I kind of agree that not all problems like this should be fixed with drugs. We don't understand all the brain still, so a lot of drugs affect the, in other ways that we still don't understand fully. That's a problem in the over-medicated society in the U.S. Okay. Yeah, I understand that you, I mean, you, you are laying out the, uh, the assertions that are made in favor of treating uh, anxiety as a medical condition and in favor of inventing this uh, illness called anxiety disorder. So you, you, have, you have, yes, you have... I think correctly laid out the series of assertions that's supposed to support that, but these are not arguments. These are just this is just an assertion, um, and you haven't addressed any of the actual problems that this raises. So to begin with, well, you know, you have anxiety that exists uh, for a, a good reason, and then you have anxiety that exists for uh, for not a good reason. Well, who who determines? First of all, who determines what is a, an appropriate reason to feel anxiety? Who, who exactly is in a position? Well, the psychiatrists and the medical industry, they decide. Who, why do they get to decide that? What, how are they experts in, in what are good reasons and reasonable reasons to feel anxious? 
here, here's a list of reasons why you should feel anxious. If you're anxious for these reasons, you shouldn't feel anxious, and that's an illness. Do you not see how totally arbitrary that is? Are we not supposed to sit back and say, well, who, where are you getting this from? Why are you the authority on this? Just because you have doctor in front of your name, does that, that, that makes you an expert on something as, <laughs> on a, a question as, as big as, you know, what are the appropriate reasons to feel anxiety? So who, why do they get to determine that? What are they basing those determinations on? And also, even if we could all agree, I don't know, by majority vote or some democratic process that uh, there are, you know, there, there are unreasonable anxieties that people feel, well, that in and of itself doesn't prove that it's an illness. You know, maybe there are unreasonable anxieties. I think that there are, sure. But maybe that's also part of being a human being is to experience unreasonable anxieties. And here's another question too. And I, and I, you know, I've, I've made the same point about depression and I think it's the case of, uh, with anxiety as well. And this is something people don't like to, 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 possibility people don't like to think about. Okay, but what if, you know, if you're feeling anxious and you can't identify an exact reason for it, what if life itself is a reason to be anxious? What if simply existing as a mortal human being is reason enough to feel anxiety? Just like with depression, what, what if there are just realities about our, the human condition that can sometimes cause people to feel despair? Now, that doesn't mean that you should feel anxious all the time or you should be in despair all the time. Obviously, you shouldn't. It also doesn't mean that you shouldn't look for, for help if you're struggling with these feelings. I'm not saying that either. All I'm saying is that uh, maybe people who are feeling depressed or feeling anxious, they're not like diseased and they're not even being unreasonable. It's just, it's, it, is, it is tough to exist as a human being. There are many things about life that create anxiety. I mean, let's start with the reality of death. I mean, the fact that death hovers over all of us all the time and we know that eventually it will come and claim us and we will cease to exist in the physical realm. I mean, that alone is something that can make people feel anxious. And you can feel anxious about that anytime. And, uh, but, and it might be in a kind of ambiguous, amorphous way where you don't really understand where the feelings are rooted from, but maybe that's part of it. I mean, um, so maybe these are things that come with the human condition, which again, just because something is uh, uh, fundamental to the human condition, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything to um, help ourselves you know, deal with those realities, but it does mean that just labeling it a disease and trying to solve the problem with a pill might not be, you know, the, the, the best approach. Uh, it, it, it certainly might not get to the root of the problem. You know, this weekend, uh, you probably didn't know because I just learned in this moment right now, is the Grammys. And if you're a true member of the SPG, you're aware of the outsized share of influence pop culture has on my life. I am a pop culture fanatic. Everyone says that about me. Although my affinity for televised award ceremonies is widely recognized, it's my notorious status as a rap mogul that uh, gives this award show truly venerable significance in the Sweet Baby Gang. I perused the nominees, and sadly, um, I wasn't among them, probably because I don't have anything that could possibly be nominated for it. But still, it's a grave injustice um, that uh, my hip-hop forefathers, Pooh Shiesty, and Spot 'em Got 'em have also endured, and now I'm experiencing the same thing. All this to say, I'm proud to announce the newest Sweet Baby album T-shirt, which is which I have uh, with me right now. It is hopefully you can see this in the thing. It is the Notorious SBG, and uh, the great thing is that this is not a copyrighted violation. We did check with our lawyers. This latest addition to my swag shack over at DailyWire.com is available right now. And uh, you don't want to miss out on this opportunity to confuse people, culturally appropriate at the same time, experience the immortalization of both my prominence in the hip-hop world and lyrical prowess in the form of yet another instant classic. If we sell enough of these, I very well may have to spit bars for the game. You, no, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to have another promise I don't keep. Cut that. I'm not doing that. That's, I will not even pretend that I'm going to do that. Anyway, go to dailywire.com shop to get your Notorious SBG t-shirt now. Also, 
We've been running a massive 40% off sale for annual memberships, and it ends tomorrow. Don't miss the chance to celebrate one of the greatest moments in Daily Wire history with one of the greatest offers. When you join, you get access to the best content, one of the fastest-growing libraries. We're adding a ton of new content this year with kids' uh, content, uh, more movies and shows, hard-hitting documentaries, and much more. Remember, this is your last chance to get 40% off your annual membership at dailywire.com slash subscribe with code DONOTCOMPLY. The sale ends tomorrow, so head to dailywire.com slash subscribe right now. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Well, on Wednesdays for our members block portion of the show, I answer emails from listeners looking for advice. And I also sometimes issue corrections to the bad advice offered by people on other forums, especially uh, TikTok. And the bad advice videos are curated by my producer, McKenna, and sent to me, uh, at which point I uh, go through them all. And, and that's when I become depressed and disgusted and, and the light inside me dies a little more. But at least it makes good content. And that's how the creative process works. But yesterday, uh, I was sent one bad advice video that is so bad in which I found so viscerally abhorrent and repulsive that it, it immediately graduated from members block fodder to the daily cancellation. This, of course, is the greatest honor I can bestow on a terrible person. And we have a very terrible person for today's segment. Jessica Ashley bills herself as a divorce coach. This is apparently an actual industry that exists in our country. After a brief Google search, I discovered there are many divorce coaches and divorce consultants charging exorbitant hourly rates to encourage and facilitate the dissolution of marriages. Um, divorce coaches should not be confused with divorce lawyers. These are two different species of blood-sucking parasites. Think of one as kind of like a deer tick and the other is a dog tick. And even the ticks have ticks, as there are now many pricey online certification programs offered for those who wanna become certified in the field of divorce coaching. So if you wish to be a certified, a certifier of, a uh, certified divorce coach, then you get, then you have to do that. If you wanna be a certifier of people who are certifying divorce coaches, there are probably different programs for that. And if you want to coach people who certify the people who certify the people who are divorce coaches, again, there is, I assume, a program for that. One thing we've learned about the modern, modern culture is that for every evil, for every brand of misery, there are a million vultures circling, looking for you know, a way to make a fast buck on someone else's poor life choices. In fact, there is so much misery and so many soulless profiteers trying to monetize it that it becomes a kind of parasitic infinite regress. And somewhere in this garbage heap lies Jessica Ashley who offers three-month and six-month divorce subscription services. Uh, she's also on call, by the way, ready for a phone or FaceTime consultations for anyone desperate and stupid enough to pay the money for it. And sorry, fellas, I got to tell you, she does stipulate that she is a divorce coach for moms, specifically. Her website tagline is, a mom's best girlfriend in divorce. Though I strongly suspect that the market for divorce coaches consists almost entirely of women anyway. It's like if the cupcake wine company stipulated that it was just for women. You know, it's already kind of implied by the nature of the product. But uh, Jessica has developed a relatively sizable social media following, consisting entirely of the sorts of women who have been, you know, would have been probably tried and convicted of witchcraft if they'd been born in a different era. Uh, these are women who, who can't get enough of this kind of stuff. Listen. The very best piece of advice I've ever received about divorce came in the early days of my own divorce from a friend who'd never been divorced and in fact wasn't even married at the time. She said something so powerful, ugh, it really got in there and it still rings true today and I share it with my divorce coaching clients often. Here's the best piece of divorce advice I've ever heard. Your life is bigger than one man. Let's extend it. Your life is bigger than one relationship, one marriage, one moment in time. Even if that relationship comes with good intentions and oodles of love and big dreams and a home and kids and memories and vacations, what happens if you release your grasp that this relationship defines the whole of you and the whole of your life to see what could come next, what is happening now? There was a time before this relationship. You are heading into the next part. What are the possibilities that extend far beyond this one person? Now, the people in the comment section are absolutely blown away by these platitudes that Jessica plagiarized from the slogans on inspirational keychains at a gift shop somewhere. She's like some kind of feminist bumper sticker. And yet many of the com commenters claim that they were reduced to tears by Jessica's recitation of modernist cliches. One woman said that the video had saved her life. Which is, which is like having your life saved by a fortune cookie. Worst of all, the cliches aren't true. Because if you are betraying your vows and dismantling your marriage and running out on your husband and hurting your children in pursuit of your own personal happiness, you are not bigger than the moment. Um, there are moments in life 
that make us who we are, moments that tell us and tell the world who we really are. And if you're following Jessica Ashley's advice, then you will answer that moment by announcing yourself to be a disloyal, self-centered, shallow, superficial narcissist. You are not bigger than the moment. You are defined by it. The whole point of marriage is that two become one. And when you say, I do to your spouse, you are entering into something that is bigger than you. And from this union springs a family and children and a whole life that you could never live on your own. You're not bigger than that. If, if you shrink away from that commitment, that, 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 uh, that sacred institution that you've entered into, it's not because you're bigger than it, but because you are smaller than it. You are too small, too hollow to grasp the happiness that can be found in loyalty and fidelity to your family. In the same way, if you visit the Sistine Chapel and you find that you're bored or unimpressed by the site, it's not because you're too significant or too big to appreciate it, right? It's because you're, you're, you're such a small-minded, brain-dead idiot that you can't recognize beauty when you're standing in its presence. That's why none of the divorced cat ladies who pay Jessica for, for her consultations will go on to achieve great things or contribute to the world in any important way. None of them will. Now, they say that they, they're, getting, they're, they're divorced and they're free now and they can go out into the world and do all these impressive things. They're not going to do anything. Instead, they'll wind up dating a bunch of pathetic men desperate enough to see them as romantic options, and they'll argue with their ex-husbands, and they'll watch a lot of TV, and they'll be promoted to middle management, and they'll make uh, you know, $140,000 a year, and they'll feel very accomplished, and they'll spend their money on consumer products and cat food, and they'll tell themselves a story about the journey they've been on, but that journey will be about as interesting and unique as a Hallmark greeting card. Less interesting, actually, because at least a Hallmark card is something that you buy to express gratitude towards some other person in your life. But the women who listen to Jessica Ashley are far more focused on expressing gratitude towards themselves. They are collapsing into themselves, sucked into the vortex of their own egos, the human equivalent of dying stars, slowly evolving into black holes. Except that, you know, entire galaxies really do revolve around actual black holes. In the case of these women, that's how they see themselves, but it's not the reality. Now, Jessica has more wisdom to offer, though. In another video, she tries to explain why men might change during the course of a marriage. Here's her theory. Have you ever asked why your husband is radically changed? Why he seems like a completely different person than he was in the early days of marriage, before kids or maybe even before you got married? Have you looked back over the last few years with a fine tooth comb and everything said and done, looking for the perfect clue, an incident or event that will help bring rationale to why he has turned so hateful in his words and action when you entered into this union with such love? Have you desperately sought out the perfect Perfect things for you to say or do that will get this marriage back on track, that will get him back on track, that will maybe be the cure, marriage counseling or a couple's retreat or maybe a change in meds. Now, certainly trauma, grief, mental health issues, illness, injury, so many things can cause us to be and act totally differently. But sometimes people's masks get too heavy and they fall off and they reveal who they really are. Now, sure, okay, that might be true in some cases. There are some men who essentially dupe their wives into marriage, sociopaths who hide their true nature, their true selves. Uh, there are women who do this also. You know, that, that can happen in a marriage. But if you're a woman whose husband seems to have grown miserable and angry during the course of your marriage, you should also consider the very real possibility that he has become that sort of man in response to the sort of woman you are. Um, you should at least consider that possibility. That is, a, that is a potential explanation that you must take into account. And if you're the sort of woman who, who is inclined to seek counsel from a cliche-spewing divorce coach on TikTok, it seems rather likely that your miserable, angry, quote, hateful husband has been broken down by years spent trying to please the shallow, egotistical wench he married. Again, I'm obviously not saying this is always the case. I'm simply saying that it's a possibility you have to take into consideration. Because as men, you know, we very much want our wives to support us, to be proud of us. Um, we, we might not express that desire out loud. In fact, we probably will never say that. We aren't gener generally very adept at vocalizing those kinds of emotions and desires. But when a man comes home from, his, from work and, you know, his wife gives him a kiss and says, hi, honey, I'm so glad you're home. Or, you know, when, when his wife comes up to him, at the blue and says that she's, she's proud of him and grateful how, for how hard he works. Um, 
something like that, that, that man will immediately be on cloud nine. He will feel appreciated and respected and loved. This is what women need to understand about men. You don't need to give us very much to make us happy. We just need your affection. We, and, and we'll never tell you that. We'll never verbalize it. But that's what we need. That's what we want. We, we actually want to feel appreciated and loved by our wives, if you can believe it. That's, that's something that men in a marriage really want. Um, let me, let me give you, let me give you a secret. Here's the cheat code. This is what every man wants. Okay. This, this is, this is how you make him happy. He wants to walk in the door after work and his children run up to him and say, hi, daddy. And they give him a hug and his wife comes over and smiles and kisses him. Dinner's on the stove. Everyone is happy and glad to see him. I mean, and that, that's all. It, it really is as simple as that. That's, that's, if a man has that, he has almost everything he needs in the world. Of course not. It can't be like that every day. And every family is different. Every situation is different. Uh, it might be a situation where maybe both spouses have to work, especially in this economy. Uh, maybe the man works a different shift, so he's not really coming home at dinner time. Anyway, my point is simply to convey to you how easy it is to make a man happy, how simple our desires actually are, how comparatively little we actually want, um, how love and affection and gratitude are the things that we really need in our marriage. So, if your husband seems bitter and angry, you might consider whether you have given him any of those things anytime recently or at all. Or you could just assume that he's a sociopathic monster who was wearing a mask and only let it slip after years of marriage. That could be the case. But if you assume it's the case, there's probably a rather self-serving reason for that. That's what divorce coach Jessica Ashley isn't going to tell you, and it's why she is today canceled. And that'll do it for us today. Um, and uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a great day. Godspeed. President Trump proposes banning transgenderism entirely. Ron DeSantis wins a victory in the classroom. And Bernie Sanders charges 95 bucks to whine about capitalism. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show. 